Hello, everyone. My name is Felipe, and I'm here with the Charter for Compassion for our global read. Uh, we're waiting for some people to come into the room while we start this. I'm going to be setting up our Facebook Live. So if you can just hold on for a couple of seconds, we'll begin very soon. See, so we are setting all this up now. Perfect. We are live now on Facebook. And with that, I will um, welcome everyone to this Global Read, as I mentioned before. We are super excited to be uh, talking about the book, The Breathing Cure, by the author Patrick McCune, who is here with us. Thank you so much for being here, Patrick. Um, and the facilitator for this conversation is Shane O'Connor who will be directing this conversation and um, talking with Patrick about the book and all the different ideas that go in behind that. If anybody has any questions, you are more than welcome to post them in the chat or in the Q&A &A section of Zoom or on our, on our Facebook feed, on our comments, and then we'll be getting those questions answered by the end of the um at the end of the global read so um please let us know where you're coming from in, in the comments and be feel free to share comments and whatnot and we'll be trying to be posting that throughout the conversation um but as of now then shane uh, the floor is all yours fantastic thanks a million felipe turn on my everybody who's on the live call and and welcome to, to falter of patrick from from one irish person overseas in madrid to to an irish man back home in in Galway, it's um, it's lovely to have you on the on the live conversation. Uh, it feels like, although I've listened to maybe a hundred more than a hundred hours of your podcasts and your presentations, um, and also the training courses that I've taken, been lucky to take part as a participant, feels like I've known you some time, and yet it is the digital age we're living in, Patrick. That you know we've actually never met, but fingers crossed we'll get a chance to meet this coming May. I believe you're coming over this part of the world, so mm. um, we'll. we'll It'll happen. It'll definitely happen. So I'm really excited about the conversation. I know we're going to have space towards the end as well for other people to come in and ask questions and um, try and challenge Patrick, challenge myself. I was, as I was saying in, in the, the, the previous room, whatever we're calling that, we can put our breathing techniques to the test and see if we can get some curveball questions in there as well. But but just to, to introduce you, Patrick, and I've, I've heard you introduced so many different times in so many different ways, but at least I can try and get your name right. So it's Patrick McKeown. Um, born in County Meath in Ireland, living in, in Galway, the, the beautiful west of Ireland. And I've just heard about your, your grow and your connection to, to Galway. Um, but I believe we actually grew up not too far away from each other. So Meath and, and, and where I'm from, North County Dublin, we would have been in school around the same time, in the same part, a few kilometres away, and also then in university. But So our, our paths haven't crossed until we tried to delve into the world of breathing and functional breathing and efficient breathing and let me just do a really quick intro to who I feel I'm, meet, I'm meeting and introducing the rest of the, the, the crew here too because there's so many titles and I know you wear so many hats Patrick but but first of all a father and um, you've you've expressed that in so many great ways because your daughter is part of your um, your sharing to the rest of the world through the the apps and the Prateco um, training course as well so my daughter is actually no your daughter but they've never met because she's she is part of that training program, which is lovely. So a father, a partner, husband, and one of the world's, I would say, leading voices, uh, most outspoken and also listened to voices when it comes to, to the power of breath and breathing and this functional um, connection that we can, can have and should have in many respects. You're also a best-selling author many times over at this point, and we'll get a chance to, to talk about the, breath, the Breathing Cure, but also some of the other books. You recently had a book out on... Um, connecting yoga and, and breath work and breathing and you have other books that I have here beside me as well like the oxygen advantage and so on but also a children's book that's going to be revamped I believe and I've been part of that conversation with some of your colleagues the last few while so Chris Evans a very famous UK presenter who, who recently brought you into the conversation he, just last week I heard him introducing you as one of the top breathing scientists of the world as well so that's another hat that you wear and trainer and coach and director of 
of Oxygen Advantage and, and Proteco at the Proteco training back in Ireland, but internationally. And so the final introduction, I would say, before we can jump into some questions, Patrick, is you're someone I haven't met that I want to meet, but who has a passion to, to a bit, and hopefully I'll put myself in this category, to bring something to people that can change their lives in a beneficial way. And, and that's something today I imagine is going to be talking about breathing and, and breath. I, I don't think you like the term breath work, but breathing practices and all, all to do with breathing. Um, so first, first two questions in uh, from a guy in Galway, actually, I, I asked him not so long ago. It's, his name is Patrick McKeown, often introduced like this. But I asked Patrick just beforehand, before we came on air, is there any question that you love to be asked that you can get the flow going um, that you've often been asked before? And I've heard you ask this question many times over. And then another question that you're not so often asked, but you might be uh, you might enjoy touching on in this particular conversation. So the first question is, why is it taken so long for breathing to be embraced by the Western world? And uh, we can put that to you and we'll, we'll maybe follow that up with the with the question that you're not so often asked. Knowing that our audience here is going to over 570 plus cities in other parts of the world, so beyond the Western world, why is it taken so long for breathing as you see it, um, maybe breathing functionally to be embraced by the Western world? Yeah, in terms of, I suppose what got me into breathing is very often I started with one breathing exercise to open up my nose and it worked. And then I started an exercise and gently softening and slowing down my breathing to breathe less air. And the temperature of my hands increased. And I felt different when I started doing the opposite to what was nor normally taught about breathing. So why hasn't breathing taken on? I think there was there's a lot of misinformation. I think there's a lot of confusion around breathing. You know, it's a, it's a little bit of a minefield. And I also feel the way it was communicated, it wasn't communicated to the individual in a way that was amenable to that person. You know, the thing about breathing is we, we carry it with us all the time. It's so accessible. It's so accessible. And also to show that breathing isn't just one exercise that you fit to one individual's. You know, breathing is more complex. There's a number of different dimensions to it. And I think anybody who is teaching breathing should understand that. Now, now it's starting to take root a little bit, but still in all, it's still only innovators. So we really need to get it to the masses. There's something very, very powerful in it. Even just the ability to be able to self-regulate, you know, going into a stressful situation, to be able to bring down the speed of your heart rate. Now, anybody, regardless of whatever walk of life they are, they will always encounter a situation whereby they feel challenged in that situation. And breathing is a tremendous tool, but Shane, only when it's taught correctly, because there's a lot of ideas out there and they don't necessarily deliver what's promised. Yeah, absolutely. And we're, we're finding that day by day, but there is a, a momentum. There is a shift, I think, personally, Hugely. that's happening. And you're, you're a yes. huge part of that shift, at least from the part of the world that I'm from. Um, I, I wanted to share a tiny anecdotal story and, and then we can get into the, the second question, if that's okay, Patrick, because, you know, on a very personal level, breathing, breath work, a bit like yourself, I grew up in, in Ireland not knowing anything about it, you know, participated in local sports and yeah. went through education, similar to you, you know, wasn't really engaged in the education. Some some t subjects grabbed me in, some just, I, I was bored. I had a very similar experience from, from the experience and you can share, please do share your own experience of working with education, because I'd love to touch on education here as well, if we can. Um, but something happened, a few different shifts happened to me at different stages. And, and I started to, to embrace this concept of the, the, the simplicity of shifting from, you know, nose breathing, uh, from mouth breathing to nose breathing, slow, light, soft from our diaphragm. It took a little bit of time, but it needed for me to be in a, in a fairly big accident or two accidents, actually, to, to rebuild and re recuperate, but using the breath. And it's when I was I was traveling around the world looking for all the answers of where do we go for these the answers to how we can do the breath work best. You know, who are the gurus? And I know you love that word, but the gurus of, of breathing around the world. And I actually physically went to Southeast Asia, to, to Latin America, to places to, to really try and embrace it and, and learn it in order to try and do it for myself selfishly, 
to rebuild, but also then to share it with people, um, groups of people that I was working with. And it was only about five or six years ago that I came across your work. And there was there was definitely a penny drop moment for me where I'm thinking, you know, I've been searching around the world and there's a guy back in Ireland that's making sense to me, speaking the language that makes sense to me. And here's here's why I wanted to connect the story to you as, as a as an individual and as, and as a person that has guided me, but thousands more people as well, and through your work, but also through your books and um, and your presentations, but also your, your training courses that are out there at the moment. I sent you an email about four or five years ago. I don't know if it was during COVID or after COVID. I was on a physiotherapy bed, quizzing the physiotherapist about breathing and what he knew about breathing and trying to rebuild. And I just sent you a random email, as I do to many people that are you know seen as world leaders in their, their fields. Nobody ever gets backed for the most part. Within, I would say, 20 minutes, I got a phone call from you. And I don't know if you remember this. You, you actually called me back from email to phone call. Now, I wasn't used to people calling me back on the phone uh, and having this conversation, just a one-to-one -one conversation around where are you at, where am I at, where am I at, how can I support you and assist you in the journey to, to sharing more of this. So it was quite remarkable, actually, because I listened to probably 100 hours of you on online on YouTube and all the other, and then you're calling me on the phone. But I think that shows the type of groundedness that you have to say, listen, we can't waste time here. I've got an email in. I'm going to jump on the phone and call this person who could be absolutely anybody. But we had a lovely conversation. And since then, I've, I've been um, very much a, a, a buyer into what you're doing and, and how you're trying to bring breathing to the rest of the world. So to my next question, or your next question, I should say, because it's a question that you're not often asked, Patrick, but do you think that breathing will ever be considered a pillar of mainstream? And you're focusing on health here, but the question is, do you, do you think that breathing will ever be a pillar of mainstream health, but maybe also education? Because I think it's it's probably interconnected and interlinked, and maybe feel free to, to talk about how you might actually see that vision happening. I think it's absolutely necessary. Now, whether it's going to happen in my lifetime or not, I'm not sure. Oftentimes, I feel that the people who teach breathing normally come across it because of their own issues first. So when there's enough doctors and healthcare professionals who are experiencing burnout and in their quest to do something about their own health, they will delve into breathing and they can approach it from a scientific point of view and take it out of the realm of this left of field. Yeah. You know, if I know if I'm having a conversation about breathing with a normal GP or medical doctor, we can't have a conversation because there doesn't seem to be an interest in breathing. And I've been told it's not part of their toolbox and it's not part of their toolbox. But then many of their patients are stressed. Many of their patients have poor sleep. Many of their patients have asthma. Many of their patients have conditions associated with those issues. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really, really important that um, medics do learn about breathing. Because these people are so highly trained to understand the science that they can take this apart. You know, they would delve into this and understand it straight away. But yet... It's not just understanding it from a theoretical point of view. It's really an experiential point of view. So when is it going to be? I suppose breathing, it doesn't really promise a profit. It's time consuming. But the only thing is economically and morally, when people have the tools to be able to, you know, improve their blood circulation, know how to breathe to improve oxygen delivery, know how to breathe to improve your sleep quality, know how to breathe to reduce your breathlessness that you experience during physical exercise, know how to breathe to bring balance to the autonomic nervous system. And we see it all the time. I just worked with a professional a former, no, he's actually a pro tennis player there about two hours ago. I had him do exercises. I work with a pe person with chronic fatigue syndrome. That's, you know, very immobile for 30 years. I have him do exercise. Of course, there are different exercises, but there's still tools for those individuals, you know, and the, the tennis player, for example, was very much living in his head, anxiety, stress. So here's a person at the top of their game, but yet they didn't have the tools to be able to get out of their head. So, yeah, I think there's a huge inroad and a necessity. Um, I was working for a ch with a child at the weekend with his parent. And of course, the six year old was having none of it. And I was just thinking to myself, like, if this was taught in schools, we wouldn't have to be there. And the other thing is that children then would see it as so normal 
Now, that child of six years of age is persistently mouth breathing. Um, his sleep is problematic. Of course, if sleep is problematic, these kids can have up to 10 times the learning difficulties. And their academic achievement can be affected by their whole dental health, their craniofacial development, development of the brain. And even then, I was just saying to me, I wonder, did I go overboard just mentioning to the parent the impact of mouth breathing on the child? Because, of course, like I'm looking at it all the time. I'm reading about it. But it could have been a shock to that parent. So when I was only thinking about it afterwards, this is where we need to go with this. We have to get it into education. And it can be so seamlessly brought into education with young children. What's the nose for? You know, what's the mouth for? The mouth, what is in the mouth? So if we think about what's in the mouth, we're talking about our teeth, our tongue, our hard palate, the soft palate and the throat. And do any of those things do anything for breathing? And the answer is no. A five-year-old child will be able to tell us that. Does the teeth do anything for breathing? No, our teeth are for chewing. Does our tongue do anything for breathing? No, it's for chewing. Well, it's for mastication, but it's also for talking, communication. And then we think about the nose, that structure in the face that's sitting above the roof of the mouth. And it has many, many functions. So yeah, simple ways. Is it going to happen, Shane? I don't know the answer. Let's see. We would say here, ojalá. In, in Spain, hopefully, inshallah. Hopefully, uh, yes. But, but, but certainly it, it, it's it's organizations like the Charter that have the great reach. It's it's organizations like your own organization, the Oxygen Advantage and Prodeco, that are certainly putting it out there and being brave to say that, you know, maybe it hasn't been mainstream. We know that. But how do we get it mainstream? How do we, how do we yeah. interconnect it with health, with education and all the other systems that exist out there? Um, I love those examples that you give there, Patrick, as well, about the, the versatility. I mean, you might be using slightly slightly varied techniques with an asthma patient or somebody dealing with trauma or somebody who's doing you know high performance and just today i mean this this very day i, I started the day by making a video a yoga for kids video for one of the other the organizations that connects me with the charter for compassion which is golden ruleism but we're, we're using your techniques but in a, in a child-friendly way using child language the next session that i had today was working with a group of palestinian students that are here in madrid in the university watching their family going through genocide back home. What were we doing? We were doing breathing techniques. We were, yeah. we were going through the simple breathing techniques to manage the, the resilience, the, the nervous system, and, and working with trauma. And then one other session that followed was after these here in, in Madrid as well. So they, they only varied slightly, but it's the versatility of, of what you've been working with and sharing for, is it over 20 years now at this point? Is it well over yeah. 20? It's 22 years, yeah. It's 22 years that went pretty quick. Well, can we bring, can we start to bring the books into that play? Because from, from what I know of, of the experience that you've been working dil dil diligently, I should say, and, and plodding away for so long, working with various different clients and patients in, in Galway in your own practice. Um, and then there was something different started happening and you started writing books about it. But what was the motivation, first of all, to go from practitioner into author um, and maybe talk us, talk us about that transition and maybe we can talk about your books themselves, actually, the, uh, specifically The Breathing Cure, because that's what we're, we're advertising here today. But I know that's heavily linked to, to Oxygen Advantage as well. I felt back in 2002, even though I was working primarily with people with asthma and I had a huge interest in asthma. It's a condition that affected me all my life, you know, and you don't just have asthma. I had a stuffy nose. I was a chronic mouth breather. That's going to put you into an increased stress response. My sleep was terrible. My concentration was in school, Shane, was dreadful. I left school yeah. at 14 originally, never to go back. I'm pretty headstrong. That can be a helper. It can be a hindrance once directed the right way. I did have to go back to school one year later. I wasn't going to leave school to be a waster. I was always driven. So my, uh, my goal at that point as a 14 year old was to own my own supermarket. And I was working in a store since the age of 11. So this is back in the 1980s. You could do these things. <laughs> you can't do them now. But anyway, I went back to school one year later, but it could have been a lot easier. And, you know, I came across breathing after going through university and university was a struggle because if you have un undiagnosed sleep issues and if you're breathing in a way that's reducing blood flow and oxygen delivery to the brain, and if you're breathing in a way that your autonomic nervous system is in this constant sympathetic drive, constant state of stress, you know, it's 
it's a perfect recipe for a mind that's bombarded with thinking. And if your mind is bombarded with thinking and there's a habit of overthinking, it's very difficult to hold your attention on the, the subject that you want to study. So even though my eyes would have been looking at the page, my attention wasn't there. I would have to reread it and reread it and reread it. You know, so, and this is going to hold a lot of children back because, of course, I'm not unique. We know that 15 percent of children have sleep issues, 15 percent. We know that 10 percent of children have asthma. Those kids also will have sleep issues. I, I don't know the figures for anxiety, but I know from speaking with people in the field that with children, it's absolutely, you know, increased dramatically um, post COVID. So coming back then to in 2002, I started teaching Buteco Method, reaching out to people with asthma. The media were tremendous. Just by chance, I got some articles in newspapers um, journalists attended a couple of my courses, got me my first clients, word of mouth kicked in there, but nobody wants to know about it in terms of the healthcare professionals. So I did reach out to different people and I said, listen, it's very important for people with asthma to breathe through the nose. The nose does all the work in terms of the defense, you know, going through the various literature, showing clinical trials. You know, the first trial of the Buteco method outside of Soviet Russia, Soviet Union, was in 1994 and published in 1998. And within 12 weeks, these individuals had asthma for 21 years. The group who were doing the Buteco method had 70% less symptoms, 90% less need for rescue medication and 49% less need for inhaled corticosteroid. So, you know, the group who were doing in the control group who were doing the in-house hospital program, in other words, conventional breathing asthma Conventional management for asthma from a breathing point of view, 0% change. Now, you would think that that clinical trial would, would open up a huge amount of interest. It didn't happen. Yeah. So I started writing the first book actually in 2003. I wrote Close Your Mouth. And I wrote a book because I felt it was the only way to get this information into the hands of the people at a very small cost. I put everything into the book. It was a very simple book. The book, by the way, is still in the top 10 books, although I haven't checked it in many, many years, probably on Amazon.com. If you put in asthma or maybe it could be .co.uk, put in asthma and look for the top 10 best selling books in asthma. It's still Close up your there. Mouth. In the veil. Close your mouth. You can check it there. Now, I might be wrong because it's it's could be years since I've checked it. And then from that, you I wrote another... the first Irish guy to be wrong about something. Right? <laughs> I wrote another book then in 2004 for kids because, of course, I was working for children. That was called Always Breed Correctly or ABC to be asthma free. We then changed the title afterwards because we were putting it out for other kids. And then I wrote another book that was published in 2005 called Asthma Free. And that was published in the United States and it was published in the UK. So that was my quest. And once then from writing the books, books were a tremendous inroad to get the information out there because People go into a bookstore, they can take a chance if the book resonates with them. And, and it gives people an insight, a direct insight into your thinking that's accessible. And, you know, now, of course, books, some people read and some people don't read. So that's why I went down the whole route of apps and we put everything into the app and put it for free. You know, because I think ultimately the whole objective here is to get the awareness out there. You know, it, it's my biggest quest is. And we put it in our mission statement, our vision statement, everything with oxygen advantages. We want to get breathing out to the hands of the people. And that is our goal. And whether we put it out there for free, and that has been our objective as well, you know, in terms of, or at least at a very low cost. And so just to, to clarify again, um, Patrick, because I, I forget when you've when you've delved into this for some time, but even Buteko, when you, you talk about Buteko, Buteko was a Ukrainian physician, um, yes. you know, that that was based in, in Russia for some time and, and that you studied under. He's not alive today, but the, the wisdom and, and the practices have been passed on and, and there's a, a thriving Prodeco community. He'll be coming to Madrid with that sort of that Prodeco training, but it's it's interchangeable with with the other work that you do as well, with Oxygen Advantage for yeah. maybe more specifically for, for athletes. You're working with, you know, specific cohorts of, of women and breathing and differentiating the difference between women and men when it comes to breath work particularly and the hormonal systems and everything to do with that which is which is really fascinating but Budeco first 
that was 20, 22 years ago, you started the, the practice. And since since then, you know, 22 years back, if you were to to, to put your, cast your, your mind back when you were starting off, um, you know, when you started the journey to share to the world and the people around you as well in Galway, um, what you had discovered that was working for you, this was something, it, it had clicked, you wanted to share it and connect with, with other people with these aspirations. Would you, if you're 22 years ago, saying that you're in the position you're in today, you know, you've got a, a thriving company, there's, you're, you're invited left, right and centre, we're, we're very lucky to get you on this conversation here today, but you're travelling everywhere around the world. Um, would you say 22 years ago, you would be satisfied with where you're at today in terms of your aspirations back then? Oh, totally. In actual fact, it's way beyond any of my expectations. Now, the where I'm at today, even, you know, over the last few years, I suppose from 2015, we started to see some momentum. And I only know by I had to hire an, another person because I was a lone ranger from 2002 until 2015. So it was a pretty slow burner. And in, two, in 2015, Anna joined us, who's still here. And then we grew and grew in terms of staff. And we're still very small. We're a micro company. But we have, I think, about 12 staff now. So so now, you know, we're in a, a position that, yeah, it's been, it's been a mom momentous journey and a very enjoyable one. And sometimes a small, small bit challenging. But, you know, that comes with it anyway. And what would you put that shift down to? You say 2015 that, you know, there was momentum building and... I hear you often saying that it was like pushing something up a, a hill and, and then, you know, we're on that flow right now. We need to take advantage of this this moment that we're in. But what would you put it down to mainly? I think there was a few different things. Like in terms of I was lucky enough with meeting Mark Mahler and Samantha Mahler and Joy Mahler in the United States back in 2008. And they were myofunctional therapists, which is a tremendous therapy around for 100 years. And it's also all about the craniofacial development. And of course, they were interested in breathing and then meeting Dr. William Hang. And I started, you know, just communicating and getting that into that kind of field. Um, and then an individual walked into a dentist in California. He picked up the book, Close Your Mouth. He borrowed it from the dentist and he had asthma. And then he reached out to have a Skype call, which I was doing back then. And about two or three sessions in, he said he's a book agent. And I said, wow, great. I said, I'm writing a manuscript. And the manuscript was about bringing breathing to healthy people. Because from 2010 to 2013, I was putting out breathing exercise. But always when I was working from, tw from 2002 until tw 2013, it was always unhealthy people or people who had a problem with their health. And men weren't coming for anxiety, put it that way. So from 2010 to 2013, I was putting out courses for anxiety and panic disorder. 95% of people who attended were female. So I said, I need to really get a book out there into the hands of the male population and a book that men will resonate with and incorporated that physical training isn't just a training for the body, but it should be a training for your breathing. And that's where this cover <laughs> came That's why we have a guy with a six pack on it. <laughs> yeah. and, and also training for the brain you know, training for your mind and not that you have to do separate things because the thing with breathing is you you pretty much bolt breathing on. But this anyway, this guy then two or three sessions in, he says he's a book agent. I says I'm writing a manuscript, but he wasn't just an ordinary book agent. He was a book agent for Richard Branson, for Bishop Tutu, for Nelson Mandela. So he was one of the top book agents in the world. I sent him on the manuscript. I had 60,000 words written at the time. He came back. He said, you have to rewrite the whole thing. I says, why? He said, it's too scientific. Your audience isn't going to get it. So he, he said one sentence to me. He said, I need you to write this as if you're talking to some guy down in the pub. And hmm. I had to rewrite it with that in the back of my head. What would I say if I was having a pint of Guinness in front of me, sitting on a stool and conveying this to some guy down in the pub? So then the oxygen advantage. So I had to rewrite it, but I pulled a lot of the scientific aspect and I put it towards the back of the book. That was a huge break because that kind of put, put it out there and it gave, it gave me credibility in some way. Um, and then people became interested. Now, it was still slow. Oxygen advantage was slow, 2015, 16, but it was increasing. And COVID was weird. 
something happened in COVID. Now, I think Wim Hof did tremendous things with breathing in terms of the awareness. James and Nestor. James Nestor. Amazing. You know what he did. In actual fact, James Nestor achieved more in one year than I had done in the previous 20 years. You know, so. The breath. Correct. Breathe. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this, you need this help. You know, like I don't think anything, none of this would have happened had I be just been doing it on my own. And I'm not good at reaching out to people, Shane. Typically, I don't reach out to them. Um, but what I try and do is I try and put the work out there because I'm a little bit of an introvert. So I'm really bad at reaching out to people. But if I can put the work out there and if people get it, then typically they may reach out to me. That's how it works. Okay, thank you. And we'll certainly try to put the links to, to the books and to the app that you mentioned. There's, there's a number of apps. There's the, the children's app and, and, and hopefully we're going to be producing much more in that area of, of kids. And I, I, if we're going to hand over to questions in a couple of minutes, but I'd love to talk and zone in a little bit about where to in terms of education, knowing that the Charter for Compassion have their own education institute as well and you know can, can potentially open this up to other communities and I know Siobhan and the rest of the team that you're working with have, have created and adapted um, a fantastic model to be able to implement breathing into schools from a very young age, from the youngest age, in fact, all the way up sort of kindergarten up to, to grade 12 or the Leaving Cert uh, equivalent back, back home in Ireland. So it is exciting where, where, where to from here. But maybe before we open it up, could, could I just ask you the final question at least at this phase is, you know, where, where do you get the, the fire in the belly? I know that the Altadan is coming up back home in Ireland, and that's all about the, the celebration of that energy, the internal energy that motivates us to keep going and the fire that, that certainly is lit. It's, it's clearly lit in you, but um, where does it come from? And ideally, what would be your, your sort of ultimate goal now going forward? And I, I heard you just say before we pressed live recording that you're done. You've got one more book and you're done because there's, there's a good few books in between. But what's, what's your goal and where do you get the fire in the belly? I just love it. Like the work is the work is amazing, you know, and I actually really love reading stuff about breathing. Um, so for me, it just comes easy and I love communicating and especially if I can communicate in a way that it kind of makes sense for the person. Now, it wasn't always that way. You know, sometimes I think about teachers. And, I, you know, I'm a teacher of breathing. Um, I remember doing maths and TCD Trinity in Dublin. I um, was whatever, I don't know what year it was, but this guy was a genius up in the board. But he was such a genius that none of us had a clue what he was talking about. See, maths came easy to him. And as a result, he was he was brilliant at it. But he didn't understand that we were struggling and I was struggling. And it was only afterwards, more recently, you know, in the last couple of years, I started, I would have loved to have a teacher who struggled with maths. I would have had loved to have a teacher that had to, to really focus and break down maths in order for that teacher to understand it. Because if the teacher struggled to learn it, now the teacher fully understands that subject and they can make it so simple and they can break it down, but they also understand the mindset of the student who is struggling. Mm -hmm. And for me, things don't come now. Of course, I love, you know, reading about breathing, but I immersed myself into it and I've immersed myself into it over many, many years. And of course, you make plenty of mistakes in the way. I know when I'm in interviews, even recently on News Talk, Sinead said to me, she says, you need to start dialing down the words that you're using during those interviews. So sometimes, you know, you're always kind of dialing it down so that it's accessible to the, the person that you're talking to as best as I can, you know. Uh, yeah, you're certainly doing a good job. And News Talk being one of the, the leading Irish stations, and it was great finally that they you got got the, uh, an interview. I heard that from somebody else that had sent it to me. Actually, say, oh, it's your man again. So you, you know, I know I heard you saying you're not necessarily a household name in Ireland, but outside of Ireland, the popularity of, of the message that you're you're sharing, the techniques that you're sharing, and the simplicity of being able to implement them in straight away into your life. You know, shifting from mouth chest. To, to, to nose, to low breathing, to light breathing. Um, we're going to open it up, if, if that's okay, Patrick. I, I'm going to check in with Felipe as well. And there's lots more questions in my mind, but I don't want to take all the all the, the air here. We'll, we'll hopefully get a conversation in May when you come over to Madrid. Felipe. 
Yes, so there is a question on the chat that says, I noticed that you have developed breathing exercises for diabetics. Can you briefly explain how this can positively affect diabetics health? In terms of like with any chronic conditions, I suppose the question we have to ask is what is the chronic condition doing to the autonomic nervous system? So if you were to look at the autonomic nervous system with a person with diabetes, they, they can have poor lung health, they can have poor sleep quality, and they can also be an in increased sympathetic drive. So with, the, with putting this into practice for people with diabetes, our objective will be to improve their quality of life. So improve their sleep quality, um, but also help to, to bring their autonomic nervous system into balance. So the automatic functioning of the body. So they're not in this constant state of stress. Now, breathing exercise can also teach with opening up blood vessels and improving blood circulation and um, improving oxygen delivery. So that would be the, you know, whether it's somebody with diabetes or somebody with epilepsy or somebody with long COVID, um, improving breathing patterns to help bring balance to the autonomic nervous system is very, very important because I suppose we have to ask this question. If you have a chronic condition, and of course that chronic condition is imposing a stress on the body. And if the body is in increased stress response all the time and having poor sleep, is that going to help that chronic condition? And the answer is no. So in order to, to help any condition, um, and I'm not saying that this is a cure-all and I'm not saying it's treating anything or anything like that, but it can help to improve control and it can help to improve quality of life of the individual. We shouldn't be in an increased stress response because that certainly is not helping. Thank you. That's a wonderful answer. Another question from the crowd says, do you have any research on how these techniques have supported organizational leaders? Any thoughts on how to bring this to corporations? I, I think there's an awful lot that can be done in terms of very understudied, Philippe, very, very understudied, you know, looked at heart rate variability in business leaders, looked at slow breathing in terms of making stressful decisions and in individuals who do practice slow breathing that they had fewer errors, um, that they were more focused, they were more concentrated. So I think there's a huge need for this in the corporate environment. You know, if you look at the individuals, yesterday I had a class, I spoke with the first 10 people just to get an insight of who they were. Three of them had burnout from working in corporates. Now, two of them, interestingly, came from marketing, which I didn't necessarily think it was so stressful, but there's a situation of burnout. You know, I was, when I was as a kid and a teenager and having undiagnosed sleep issues and constantly stuck in my head and not being able to function. And society puts an awful lot of pressure on us to perform. But how can we perform and reach our full potential if we don't have good quality sleep? And if we are so stuck in our head that we don't have the capacity to hold our attention. And education doesn't teach us how to, to hold our attention. Education doesn't teach us how to concentrate. Education doesn't look at whether the student is having optimal sleep patterns. So there's, you know, education teaches us how to think. There's a huge role for education. But I don't think it's enough just to teach somebody how to think and analyze and decipher and break information. I think it's also important to teach that person the capacity to be able to bring a stillness and the quietness to the mind, to be able to direct their attention and not to be at the mercy of what's going on in the mind, because most of us are at the mercy of what's going on in the mind. That's not a nice place to be. And somebody in a corporate environment, if you're in that place, of course, you know, if, if the mind is being, being bombarded with thought, that's impeding the, the very essence of what that individual is, is contributing to. And when I work in corporates, I always say, I'm not here for the company. I'm here for you. I'm here for you, the employee, because I don't want the employee to feel that I'm being brought in. And the objective is the company is bringing me in in order to make profit for the company. No, no, no. Forget about the company. I'm here for the employee. These are tools that if you learn them, you have them for the rest of your life. We all need optimal sleep. You can improve it. Don't sleep with your mouth open. You all need, we all need to understand that if our breathing is fast and shallow, how is that feeding into a stress response? If we're going into a situation and our heart rate is elevated, how do we bring down the speed of our heart rate? 
how do we get out of our mind? Not just about doing mindfulness with directed attention. It's more than mindfulness. It's changing the physiology to influence blood flow and oxygen delivery to the brain. And what's more, it's not by taking the deep breath. The more air we breathe as human beings, the less oxygen that's delivered throughout the body, including the brain, because the more air we breathe, the more we blow off the, gar the gas carbon dioxide from the blood through the lungs. This in turn causes our blood vessels to constrict throughout the body and this in turn reduces oxygen delivery. So we really need to investigate breathing. And if people are wondering, what's the most simplest breathing exercise you could do? Go for a walk with your mouth closed. It is a tremendous exercise. You have your mouth closed, you're breathing in through your nose. That's going to improve your breathing from a biomechanical point of view because you've got a better recruitment of the diaphragm, which is your main breathing muscle, which is located at the base of your ribs. And also from a biochemical point of view, because it helps to increase carbon dioxide in the blood, because it's the gas is not able to leave the body so quickly through your nose. And as carbon dioxide increases in your blood, now you have improved blood circulation. You've improved oxygen delivery, but you're also imposing a slight air hunger, which is quite beneficial because it's also a slight air hunger or the air hunger that you would experience during exercise. It's a slight psychological stress, of course, depending on the speed that you're exercising with, but surrendering to that. So yeah, you can make it very, very simple. There's lots but, more questions I can see. They're flying in, Patrick, about you know digestion right. health and heart health and aging health. It's great, and hopefully we're going to get them. But can I pinch another sure. tiny just here because you're talking about decision making and trying to relate it to to the work of the Charter of Compassion, you know, globally as well. Even the political, geopolitical situations in the world and the political leaders in the world. When you're looking at these leaders. Do you often ask yourself, you know, if, if only we could get to these people who are making decisions for millions of other people, often to their detriment, do you, would it be as, and maybe it's very simplistic, but if more world leaders were breathing efficiently, do you think the world would be dramatically different, you know, both self-compassion and compassion to other people around them as well? I think there's more to it than that. I absolutely do think that somebody who has control over their physiology um, will have more consideration for the people that they are leading. But I do have to ask the question, who was attracted into politics in the first place? What type of individual? And it's a specific type of person. It's a person that's very much into power. I wouldn't feel comfortable going into that situation. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, it's more an extrovert than an introvert. Yeah. I think we need balances between the personalities and also females and a balance with male. But I think really we, we can't have individuals who are so highly driven that have absolutely no consideration for humanity. And there are people in, in high echelons in politics. They have no consideration of human for humanity. Yeah, and I suppose that we can put that, you're right, it's not as simple as that, black, black and white. But in terms of the discernment piece, the decision making mm. that's going on. And I know you've worked with military in different parts of the world as well, but you know, I'm just trying to, to, to think backwards to education again. If you get people at a very young age, you know, being able to control, yes. to self-regulate, to manage their nervous system, do they then go into positions, so on and so on, to, to get to, you know, where, where yes. people's lives are, are heavily, heavily affected by poor decision making. And I think it's it's the 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 connection with discernment with being able to have that self-regulation control and breath being a huge component of that and breathing. Yeah, you know, that's a good point. Like, even if we bring it down to, say, police officers, police officers who are highly stressed will use lethal force more than if they're in balance. And a police officer who's too relaxed, they miss threatening cues. So our stress levels are going to impact our judgment and our decision levels. There's no question. I think we know that, Shane. You know, if we're feeling highly stressed on a particular day and somebody gives us a challenging decision to make, the decision that we make that day is going to be different on the basis that we're feeling highly stressed. And your, your theory, going to get back to Felipe here, Felipe, apologies, but just in terms of the book, The Breathing Cure as well, you can see it quite clearly in the, the diagrams and the graphs. If you're looking at it, you know, the, the theory, the Maslow's theory and the triangle that you have, the, the, the bottom layer you would advise, Patrick, and speak to this maybe, is 
you know, the very fundamentals, the basics, the scaffolding is, is nose breathing, slow breathing, low breathing, light breathing. For people that don't necessarily have to jump into a course straight away, if we're just to be able to switch to those, you know, it's 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 our it's our foundational shift. Yeah, for sure. Like it's it's basic, you know. Um, if you look at the animal world and you look at how a dog is breathing, if you have an adult dog and they're lying in front of the fire, the mouth is closed, their breathing is regular. It's driven by the diaphragm. You know, that's what it's about. Um, and the thing about breathing is, well, people say, well, I know how to breathe. Yes, we all know how to breathe. But how well do we breathe? And we have to think about, you know, there are many factors that affect our breathing. And even like perfectionist tendencies, chronic stress, trauma, big one, hormonal changes in females, if you have any tendency towards asthma, the belief that it's good to big breed, how many breathing instructors are putting it out there in various modalities, that if you take this full big breath that more oxygen is spreading throughout the body, is that correct? No, it's not. You know, there's no animal out in the field that's taking full big breaths during rest in the belief that more oxygen spreads throughout the body. If that animal, such as a racehorse, is going to take full big breaths, they will do it when they are running, when they are racing. So there's a, when there's a need metabolically for more air to come into the body, the respiratory rate and tidal volume naturally increase. And that's the way it should be with humans. If you want to take full deep breaths, go for a run with your mouth closed. And so the only animal, animal mammal, you know, that's breathing through their mouth, you know, consciously, uh, and many, it's going through generations now, would, would be the human. All the other mammals, animals are doing it when they're stressed or when they're sick. But I think the lesson is very, very clear there. Correct. I think we can learn from animals. <laughs> yeah. Felipe, apologies. There's lots more questions in. You're okay. We got two more questions. So um, the first question here is, uh, asking the chat, can more effective breathing positively affect people with congestive heart failure? So similar to the diabetes. Yeah, question. this is interesting in terms of heart failure. Um, there was a lot of work by an Italian medical doctor called Bernardi. And he was noting is that his patients with heart failure, with chronic heart failure, that they were breathing excessively during physical exercise. They had disproportionate breathlessness during physical exercise. So basically, if they were to go for a walk or do any sort of physical exercise, they would be overly breathless. And he asked the question, he, you know, he asked, was it the heart that was contributing to this? Or did they have a strong sensitivity to the gas carbon dioxide, which is the primary driver to breathe? And he started teaching his patients slow breathing to slow down the respiratory rate to six breaths per minute. And this in turn will help to reduce the chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide. And it does this via helping to bring balance to the autonomic nervous system through a different mechanism, strengthening the barrel reflex. But, you know, in simple terms, here is an individual who has published quite a number of papers with the application of slow breathing and knows is the best way to breathe slowly. And when I say slow breathing is to also to breathe silently. In other words, don't hyperventilate. So by slowing down your breath and, you know, six breaths per minute might be a little bit too much for people to start off with. But how about starting off with breathing in for two seconds and out for three seconds, very softly and slowly and do that for a while. You know, it could be five minutes twice daily or, you know, 10 minutes twice daily. And then after a few days, maybe you can increase it to breathing in very softly and silently for three seconds and out softly and silently for five seconds. And then after a few days, you could be breathing in for four seconds and out for six or in for five seconds and out for five seconds. In other words, dip your toes into the water. But slow breathing helps to reduce the chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide. So there's an example, disproportionate breathlessness for people with chronic heart failure, because we can influence oxygen delivery and blood flow to the heart. The heart isn't just responsible for pumping blood throughout the body. It needs its own blood supply. And nose breathing would be very, very important there. It also helps with venous return because of the position of the heart and the diaphragm. So in terms of nose breathing with better recruitment of the diaphragm, yes, it can help um, cardiovascular health. Amazing. We love easy suggestions. So that was great to understand that a little bit. Sure. 
Uh, another question that came on Facebook, this is actually really interesting. So this person hasn't read your book, but they got into this other video in our newsfeed and they got stuck in it because they're very interested in breath work, which at the beginning of this conversation, I noticed that Shane said something about you not liking or not wanting to be linked with breath work or breathing exercises. So the question that this person has, and I think it might be relating to the, your reason and behind all this is, how is, I mean, do you believe that breathing is a spiritual experience? Can it be a spiritual connection? And if so, how can we manipulate that? Well, it depends on what's your definition of spirituality. You know, I can give mine, but it might be at odds with yours. Um, you know, for me, in terms of spirituality is the degree to which you're connected with everything that's going on around you. And it's when you're in a state of no mind that you can really experience life through your senses as a human being. And that you're connected there. And Shane kind of touched on this without calling it spirituality earlier on. You know, when he was talking about um, decision makers, you know, are they really connected with the life that's going on around them? Because if we are connected with the life that's going on around them and connected with human beings, we're less likely, I think, to make decisions that are going to be so grave for many, many people. So my my kind of, you know layman's language definition of spirituality is the degree to which we are out of thought and connected that we're fully immersed in the life that we have been given here and in order to achieve that state we need to be out of thought we also need to have optimal sleep quality and we do need to have good balance of the autonomic nervous system we need to be able to breathe in a way that we're able to influence our state of mind. This is going beyond mindfulness. You know, mindfulness itself, you know, is a spiritual practice. Of course, it was, it's a, an essential part of Buddhism. But developed two and a half thousand years ago in a time that was very different for human beings. So we need to have a technique now that suits the life that, that we are in today. And we do have chronic stresses. We have a lot going on. You know, we have to look at modern living and ask, like, how far removed are we from life? You know, getting up at eight or seven or six o'clock in the morning and working until six or seven p.m. at night for me is far removed from life. You know, I don't want to spend my entire I love my job, but I don't want to spend my entire life totally immersed in work and missing out what life has to offer. So spirituality is the degree to which I am outside of thought. But then I have to ask the question, well, how can I achieve that state? I do need good sleep quality, breathing through my nose during sleep, um, waking up feeling fresh and being able to slow down my breathing that my body can tell the brain that I'm safe. And when the brain interprets that I am safe, then a calmness can come into the brain. I don't think a calmness can come into the brain if the brain is interpreting that the body is under threat. And if we are breathing faster and harder in upper chest, that's what the brain is interpreting. So a person with dysfunctional breathing patterns or poor breathing patterns or suboptimal breathing, they are less likely to be in a, a state of no mind because their, their mind is going to be in a state of anxiety. And on that topic, Patrick, of spirituality and, and even religious practices, I think there's been, been some really interesting studies and research done, and you may allude, may have alluded to them in the past, but when people are in the practice of praying, whether you're from you know Jewish background, Muslim background, Christian background, Buddhist background, or whether you're doing another practice that you consider spiritual, maybe some people consider yoga spiritual, in the practice itself, the people's mind, the vagus nerve is tapped into the mind is clear, but also the breathing, when they're studying the breathing, it goes down to about six breaths per minute. All across the board, when they're studying people in, in practice, the big question for me is when we do our practice, whatever that might be, 90 minutes on the yoga mat, you've just written a book about this recently, Patrick, but why do we leave the church, the mosque, the synagogue, and then start breathing inefficiently outside, you know, and, and not having this beautiful gem that we're practicing being able to calm the body, the mind, the nervous system. There's questions that come out of that, but the studies are really interesting because they're saying religious practice, people who practice their faith during their practice are actually breathing really efficiently and functionally. Yeah, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. That's that's Bernardi again, actually, Wedley. I'm sure there's other authors too, but 
he he looked at how people breathe when they they said the ave maria um but also yoga mantras and uh they slow down their respiratory rate down to six breaths per minute, which is the optimal breathing rate to bring balance to the autonomic nervous system. You know, and like the essence of that, like it's just absolutely amazing in terms of prayer, being able to achieve this and um, that it, it wasn't just a psychological crutch or a psychological comfort that saying a prayer was that there was a higher being looking after you. There was also a physiological um, effect. And literally, by saying that prayer, you were telling the brain that your body is safe. So I think it's tremendous. It's amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much. One last question before we close this. Are there any videos available to show how to improve people's breathing <laughs> instead of reading it? Like we're talking about someone here saying that their father is very elderly. He can't really read a book. Are there any videos that either you or some other organizations or institutions are putting out there online for people to learn more about how to breathe better? For somebody who is elderly, go very, very gentle. And it's really about light breathing and soft breathing and slow breathing. Um, our, we have a number of guided meditations, which are very, very gentle. And if you just go in on YouTube and you put in Patrick McKeown, guided breathing exercises, and there's one for anxiety. They're, they're also on our website, oxygenadvantage.com. There's a, a tab called resources and then free guided meditation. There's one for kids, you know, preparing for exam. There's a, one for an athlete, musicians and different walks of life. I think they would be a great place to start. You know, use relaxation to induce a change to your breathing patterns and to do it very, very gentle and especially to suit the age of the person. Um, we always have to tailor breathing exercises according to breathing pattern, age and state of health. And it's not to make it complicated. It's just to make it safe. Thank you so much. And I'm going to come into the screen now. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Shane, for being part of this wonderful conversation. What a fascinating topic and see the implications that breathing has not only in the physical and mind, you know, things that are going on, but I think that afterwards in these last questions, you know, getting to the spiritual sense of things and how the interconnectivity at all is quite powerful. So thank you both for uh, participating on this conversation. So let me just tell our, our people watching and our viewers that we have our third Global Read this Friday. This is such a fun experience. Global Reads are amazing. It's so good to hear from authors and, and what they're thinking and how they come with the process of writing their books. So this Friday, we have I Shall Not Hate by Dr. Izeldin Abu El Aish. And it's gonna, this conversation is going to be facilitated by Marge Andre, who's part of the Compassionate York region in Canada. Uh, Dr. Izeldin Abu El Aish is a Palestinian doctor, Harvard trained, that uh, was raised in a refugee camp in Gaza. And so I think it's a it's going to be a very, very interesting conversation to have, especially now that we are witnessing this horrible genocide in that area. Um, we have a webinar going on every Wednesday with Marilyn Turkovich, The Magical Ability of Music to Inspire Action. Marilyn acts as a DJ, basically, and shows different kinds of music to inspire different things. This past week was about uh, justice, and now the next one's going to be about ecology. And um, so it's all these different topics, almost covering the different sectors of the Charter, every Wednesday at 8 a.m. Pacific, and it's going to be until the end of March. Last but not least, we have our Charter Sangha. It's a circle of trust where you are welcome to join anyone is welcome to join every last Saturday of the month. So this will be on Saturday, March 30th at 9 a.m. Pacific, a time to meditate, a time to do some breathing, some conversation and some sharing for everyone to join us there. And so with that, I uh, thank you once again, everyone, for being part of this conversation. Shane, Patrick, again, thank you. Thank you so much. And hopefully we'll be seeing you again soon. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Pleasure. Thank you very much, Felipe. Thank you, Patrick. You're mean my good. Talk to you very soon. Thank you, Shane. And watch the space for children, for youth, for education. I, I think we're going to be working together, hopefully very, very soon. Great. Great, great. Thank Long. you, guys. Bye.